Hello and welcome to the Bestseller Experiment, where we continue to discover what makes a bestseller and inspire you to start, finish and publish your book. I'm Mark DeVoe. And I am Mark Stay, and our eternal gratitude, as always, to the wonderful people who keep this podcast going. And they are our patrons over on Patreon and our academics on the Bestseller Academy. Without your ongoing support, we simply could not keep this podcast going. Sign up to Patreon and you get all sorts of extra stuff, uh, loads of deep dive episodes, hundreds uh, of hours of, of deep dive stuff, uh, including most recently, we did a deep dive with Ian W. Sainsbury, award-winning best-selling author. And we, I spent over an hour in his company. We're editing a page of his book. It takes a real deep dive into the edit process. And we've had great feedback on that already. And over on the Academy, we've got courses. We've got a fantastic community. And, you know, you'll have me and Mr. D as your tutors. Uh, and so if you want to find out about that, go to academy.bestsellexperiment.com. Dot com and just look us up on Patreon for the Patreon stuff. Mr. D, how are you, sir? I'm doing great, Mark. And actually, just on that note, you remember last week we were talking about Susie Edge and her incredible TikTok uh, mm. successes uh, as an author, 50 million views that she's got. Um, we were coaching about it just this Monday in the Academy, right. talking about TikTok and the secret sauce and formulas of <laughs> how to make it happen because we've, di we've dived a bit into what uh, Susie's been doing and there's some very interesting things that came out of that. So yeah, all kinds of great stuff happening over there. And how are you, Mr. Stay? How's life been the last week? Um, Writing-wise, it, it's been weird because I hit a wall. I, I'm three quarters into the first draft of, of Woodville number four and, uh, you know, when you get that feeling, it's I, I, I just thought these... My antagonists weren't working. Something wasn't quite right. Uh, and I, so I stopped. Uh, I did that thing, uh, which I, I tell people in the academy, it, you know, works for me. So I thought I'd better try it again just to make sure it still works for me, <laughs> which is I sat down and told the story from the antagonist. I've got two of them, two antagonist point of view. And then I realized what was missing. I realized what my mistake, and I tied it into the theme as well. And I gave them their own journey of change, made them the hero of their own story, just on a little one, one page, simple exercise, boom, cook it on gas again. And it's just one of those things that, you know, comes with a bit of experience, but you, one, you get this spidey sense that something isn't quite working. And two, you think, okay, I think I know how to fix that. Let's give it a go. And, uh, and so I did. Uh, Brilliant. so it, it's, um, it, I, I've broken my, you know, one of the things we talk about, which is we say to people, just finish it, just get to the end and finish it. Doesn't matter. I've stopped three quarters. I've gone back to the beginning and I'm tidying up after me, which I know we tell people not to do, but we usually tell people not to do that if it's their first book and they haven't finished it because there is a danger you could end up just tidying up and never finishing. But I know I can finish a book. So I'm going back and tidying up behind me. So excellent. So yeah. Yeah, yeah. So well, you know, there are that. no rules. We know that, and we've learned. That's the yep, one yep, thing yep. we've learned. There are there are guidelines and principles, but in like every every situation accounts for its own needs. It reminds me actually of a brilliant little post. You know, some of these funny kind of posts you see on Facebook um, and on socials about writing. Mm -hmm. And it was me, chapter one. I think you may have even posted this. <laughs> me, chapter one. Ooh, the plot thickens. <laughs> <laughs> me, halfway through my book. Ah. Oh. The plot thinens. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I did post that and I did get people giving me advice saying, oh, if the plot's too thin. No, that's not my problem. Mate. I just put that up to share with a group. My, my problem is I've got too though. much bloody plot. Too much plot. Um, yeah, Good but problem no, to have. Uh, yeah, I guess so. Uh, so, yeah, it's um, that's cooking on gas. And I've been out and about. We've got new bookshops opening around us as well. I love this. I love the fact there are new bookshops opening up. It feels like yeah. it's, it was always the reverse, bookshops closing down and downsizing. New bookshops. And Are these local to you? Yeah, so we, we've, um, Herne Bay had a children's bookshop a few years ago, which did close down during COVID. And then we, we've got a works, which does kind of... Um, they, they they do kind of special print run stuff, end of end of print run kind of stuff. Although they they're changing as well, so we didn't have an indie bookshop, we didn't have an independent bookshop, and so we got a place called the Little Green Bookshop, lovely little indie bookshop. So I popped in there, said hello, uh, gave them some copies of my books, and hopefully we're going to be doing some events with them uh, later in the year. And then on Friday. Uh, there's a new bookshop opening in Ramsgate, which is a few miles that away, uh, called the Bodega Bookshop. And so I'm going to pop in there and say hello. And, uh, and what what I do, um, listeners. So if you're if you know, especially if you've got a new bookshop, try and get there on opening day. 
Take, give them free copies of your books. Say, local author, here's a free copy. Give it a go, which was great because certainly the, uh, Jackie, the owner of the little green bookshop, she was like, "Oh, great! I can I can start a local author section." You know, so that that triggered something. Also, Brilliant. I've got my um, Ghost of Ivy Barn chocolate bars here as well. So <laughs> take it in, Fantastic. take it in. Cho- little chocolate goes a long way, folks. Oh. Uh, so yeah, so that, that was uh, See, bro- Mr. Abramovich. <laughs> he brings gin to his publishers, he doesn't does, he? Yes, and, and, yes, and you yeah. bring chocolate. To be honest, I think you're both onto something really good there because like that's my that's basically my Friday night. It's a winning combination. <laughs> well, you think I'm joking, but I'm not actually. Yeah. That is my Friday night. <laughs> <laughs> and a good Netflix show. Marvellous stuff. Brilliant. But um, absolutely brilliant. Well, we, and we have such an incredible guest. Well, I just want to dive in and listen to this interview. It's so go, exciting, yeah. Mark. So tell us about our guest this week, Ian Skewis. Ian Skewis is an author and a freelance editor, as well as an associate editor for Bloodhound Books. His debut novel, A Murder of Crows, was a number one bestseller and was longlisted for the Guardian's Not the Booker Prize prize. And the, the audio book of A Murder of Crows, which Ian narrated, won the Gold Acorn Award for Best Audio Book. So we discuss, we discuss developing the story of A Murder of Crows in different media. He did comic books and plays, narrating his own audio, his own audio book. And we talk about how the book stemmed from a traumatic incident from his childhood. And just a warning that suicide is discussed in this conversation. So if that's something you don't want to hear about, skip the first seven minutes of our conversation. So let's dive in and listen to Mark chatting with the most informative and incredible Ian Skewis. Ian Skewis, welcome to the bestseller experiment. How are you today, sir? I'm tickety-boo, thank you. Lovely to be here. (laughs) Wonderful stuff. Great to have you on the show. And this is, uh, you've got quite an extraordinary story of how you got to publication. We're going to talk about your debut novel, A Murder of Crows, which was a uh, number one bestseller, long listed for The Guardian's Not the Booker Prize. Um, but rumour has it, this book took about 28 years to come to fruition. And it began with what sounds like a really, really traumatic incident from your childhood. Can you Can you tell us about that? Uh, yes, uh, it was, um, I think it was 1979. I was nine years old and, um, me and my parents were, um, out in the countryside and we used to go for a lot of walks. Um, we didn't have a car, so that was probably why looking back on it, it was easy, you know, it was cheap and cheerful. Um, and we lived quite near the countryside at the time. This was in Dumbarton and we were on the, on the return journey and, um, my dad had spotted this poor man first. Uh, this was um, someone who um, basically was a. We, we saw um, a dead body hanging from a tree, Bloody and hell. it was a, a man who we later found out had committed suicide um, because I think he'd been in debt. Um, and my mum and me were there too. My mum had kept me away from the body, but. Um, even now, I, I, when I think on it, um, it's as if I'm just a few feet away, even though it was a much further distance. And I, I'm looking up at him and I can see that he's got, you know, I think he had like a long coat. I think he actually had a, a cap. And I wondered if I'd made some of that up. And I did ask my mum, you know, fairly recently, was that the case? And she said, yeah, I'm pretty sure he did have a cap on. Um, so he was hanging from this tree and my dad phoned the police. Uh, the police were already on the way because someone else had spotted the, this man. He was already dead. Um, so that experience, it, it sounds more traumatic than it actually was because, um, because I was at a distance from it. I was kind of protected from it, you know. So, and it became fictionalized very, very quickly. The whole street obviously was speaking about it, all the kids. So, all these ghost stories started emanating, you know. So, the whole thing became mythologized very, very quickly. So, and for years I denied it. And it wasn't until I'd actually written the book and then I had a bit of distance from it. And I realized that actually, yes, the, that experience had affected me much more than I had thought. And it was really 
that that gave rise to my first book, A Murder of Crows. So, and although I've not mentioned that particular thing in the book, you know, why would I? You know, it's, it's I wouldn't. It would be distasteful. But the the idea that the countryside can be a very dark place mm. um, is very prevalent all through the book. So it was really that that created the atmosphere, if you like, the setting for A Murder of Crows. Blimey. Um... I mean, were you an imaginative child anyway? Were you were you a child who was writing, making things up, or did do you think this might have sparked something within you that sort of t- that that got you writing? Uh, I was definitely imaginative. You know, I in fact I think it was so imaginative I found it quite difficult to differentiate sometimes between reality and fiction, even when I was young. And I think it also comes about because we were very poor. You know, you know. Um, I didn't have a bike, didn't have roller skates. You know, I had to kind of learn to utilise what I had. So when Star Wars came out, for example, in 1977, I couldn't afford, you know, my parents couldn't afford to buy me the figures. I didn't even get to see the film at the cinema. So I had to hear about it secondhand from my friends who'd all seen it. And um, instead of Star Wars figures, I used to use felt tip pens. So the black one would be Darth (laughs) Vader. I know it sounds bonkers. No, no, no. And the yellow one would be Luke Skywalker. And I would just take the lids off and have them hanging. So they would, so they they became the figures, but also the the lightsabers, you know, fighting each other. And then if one of the lids fell off, that was one of them being decapitated. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so yeah, I was very, very imaginative as a child, but it was partly through necessity as much as anything else. Wow. Um, I mean, if it's okay, I'd just like to go back to that that thing that your mother did that any mother would do, which is to turn you away, to cover your eyes, and you yeah. only get you only get a glimpse of the thing. But in some ways, it's like you know, like in a horror story or a horror movie, when you only half see something, it's usually worse in your imagination, isn't it? Did you? Have you spent, and as you said, you know, that thing of did he have a cap, did he not have a cap, have, having all those fragmented pieces in your mind, have you spent a lot of your time trying to sort of piece that together, trying to trying to put together a, a, an image from the glimpse that you saw? Um, I, I think it's, it's difficult to say. I mean, even now, you know, the, the image is quite clear in my head, but I think, and I, I I, I was obviously close enough that some of the details that I've remembered do seem to be correct. You know, the cat, for example, which even now I sometimes think, did you know, if he, he had hung himself, wouldn't he have struggled with the cat not have came off? You know, yeah, yeah. I, we do question these things, but my mum says the same thing. But again, who's to know really? Because yeah. it's such a shocking thing. Who's to say that even my mum's interpretation is 100% correct? So I think there's a, you know, yes, it happened. Yes, there was a dead body from a tree, but all the other things associated with it, I don't know even now if I ever will, how much of it is real and how much of it in terms of the detail is something I've done to fill the gaps a little bit, you know, to try and yeah. comprehend it perhaps. Yeah, the memory is a very strange and sort of elastic thing, isn't it? Yeah. It's, um, yeah. yeah. And it, yeah. there might even be a bit of a defence mechanism there as well, mm-hmm. maybe in some way that some of the details are there to try and prevent the emotional context of it as well. Yeah, yeah. Well, tell tell us about Murder of Crows. Uh, as I said, it, the, I've read elsewhere that it, it took something like twenty eight years to sort of to come about. Tell us about the sort of from the first uh, thoughts to the finished book, without taking twenty eight years to do it. <laughs> we got about twenty minutes. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was going to be a graphic novel when I was about 19. That's, it was 1989 that I started writing it. And I was a, I went to art school. And um, then it transpired that art school just wasn't the place for me. And so the idea of this graphic novel, um, which did have a murder, that much I do remember. Now, I did do some of the illustrations, which I don't have anymore, unfortunately. And... Um, so the, the, there was a murder at the heart of it, and then I abandoned it because I, I'd left art school. Then round about 1993, um, I joined, I was looking for a place to exhibit my next lot of artworks. So I was still doing art, and um, that happened to be the Ramson Theatre um, in Glasgow. And um, 
it turned out I didn't know it was a theatre when I entered the building and I was interested in acting. I had been for a while. I'd actually joined an, an amateur dramatics group very briefly when I was at art school. Um, so I auditioned. I just thought, let's just go in, audition. Um, and I got a part and um, I ended up becoming a, an actor there for about 18 months, did a bit of stage management as well. And then I went to drama school, got a place at drama school and um, spent the next three years there. Then I was a professional actor for a few years. And while all this was going on, this graphic novel had transformed into what was going to be a stage play. So it was about 80 right. pages long now. And I had interest at one point from a director I'd worked with in Norway. Um, but then acting, I just I just got fed up with it because I, I felt I was jumping through hoops all the time, mm -hmm. you know, but, you know, like clapping like a seal. And I just thought... <laughs> I'm exhausted by all this and and I was getting you know I was getting work but it just wasn't enough you know I, I know and I did do some great stuff you know that I really enjoyed I did some Shakespeare etc but it wasn't enough I wasn't fulfilled and so I moved on decided uh you know I had a lot of debts as well at the time and I thought I need to get you know quotations are a real job um, <laughs> and that, that's what I did it ended up working you know in pr the perfume department in House of Fraser um, I read tarot cards at one point oh. um, yeah over the phone if you please yeah, <laughs> make of that what you will um, and um, I ended up working catering for an another 11 years and then it was around about 2010 that I finally had a very a kind of prototype novel for a murder of crows. And it took away, you know, I finally had what was in my head on paper, the way I was envisaging it. And um, well, fast forward another seven years and then finally um, I got a publishing deal and the damn book <laughs> finally got out there. <laughs> <laughs> right. There's, there's lots to unpack there. Um, yeah. It's a lots long story. <laughs> no, so, I'm, I'm loving it. I love the fact that it was graphic novel. It was a play. And was it a question of finding the right um, medium for it? Because graphic novels, I think uh, I've read you, like me, you're a fan of Alan Moore, the Swamp yeah. Thing, you know, stuff. And so why was that the first... Did that just feel like the natural home for it, or how did that how did that work out for you? What drew you to that? I think at the time, because I was I was hoping to get into art school, it, it kind of went with the territory. But mm -hmm. I was a, a, and still am a big fan of Alan Moore's Swamp Thing. Swamp Thing mm -hmm. was a big influence to a certain extent on again on that atmosphere. Um, because when he wrote Swamp Thing, it was it was almost like reading poetry. It was yeah. beautifully done, and the artwork was stunning. And I love that very kind of dark, gothic atmosphere. So some of that obviously found its way into Murder of Crows as well. You know, mm -hmm. the, it was a very dark kind of ethereal atmosphere. Um, so it kind of seemed, yeah, the, the right state. But I think as you touched on earlier, it, it took a long time for me to find the right medium for that story. And finally it became a novel. Um, and uh, But it was a long meandering journey, you know, to get there. But were you, as you were ex experimenting with the different media, were you sort of find, as you say, with the graphic novel, there was the atmosphere. With the play, perhaps you got something out of that. Were, were you picking up elements of it that eventually found their way into the finished novel? Yes, yeah. I mean, certainly um, I wouldn't be an editor now, I don't think, if I hadn't have gone to drama school because I learned mm. a lot about yeah. dialogue and, and breaking down scripts. And um, that that has been carried with me, certainly, you know. So that the so all those things I've picked up over the years from all the different changes I've made, you know, um, have all fed into that book and they feed into what I do to this day. Not to not to uh, dispute the um, authenticity of the great noble art of tarot card reading, but oh, was goodness. there was there an element of <laughs> storytelling in that that you carried over as well? Uh, I guess so, but it, it was it was more. I have to say that that particular job it was a uh, I was pretty desperate to, to at the time you know to to do it and very very few people who were doing it really believed in it and I mm -hmm. I didn't it was a job and to be honest a, a lot I, it was a night job as well a lot of the people were phoning 
um, were actually people who just needed a bit of, of help. Yeah. So often I would actually put them onto the Samaritans because yeah. a lot of them were phoning. We, you could almost read between the lines in some cases. A lot of them were, they had financial worries or relationship worries. Some of them had a much darker tale to tell, um, abuse, for example. And so I, I would kind of put the cards to one side and just say, right, well, I can give you this number to call and you, you can seek help that way. And um, so it was a, it was a, an odd job, that one. But I suppose, yeah. it, I guess it was more acting. You know, it was more about, because I was reading the cards. I mean, I did, I did, I did get a bit of training, and, you know, in terms of what the cards meant, you know, and when they were lined up, you know, what the story was. So I did, it, it always kind of did it properly you know because i've always like i guess you, you still have to have a bit of integrity yeah whether you believe in the, the cards or not you know because it was a job at the end of the day but it's not one of my happier memories i have to say it was it was a, a tricky one i felt i was being someone i didn't want to be you know because yeah. I, I needed the money i was doing a job that i didn't really believe in my heart wasn't in it and it was more about helping people than actually trying to tell their fortunes you know that that's how i looked at it yeah that's it's it's almost like you you know you've got an, an audience there with expectations they want you to tell you that there's hope that there's there's something around the corner and that's um yeah. that can be a difficult thing to do sometimes can it yeah especially when you know, you don't want, I didn't want to lie, you know, about yeah. it either. So, yeah. and sometimes the cards would come up with something really awful and you can tell that person's already in dire straits. And I yeah. thought, I don't want to tell them that. So, so I would just kind of put the cards to one side and, and maybe get a bit more info from them and then say, right, here's a number you can call. So often it was the Samaritans, you know, yeah. that I would put them on to because that, you know, and I did speak to the people in charge about that as well, you know, about, you know, what do we do in that situation? You know, it was a tricky one because it felt like the wrong outlet for actually what, you know, people really phoning more for help than they were about the tarot cards, I suspect. That mm -hmm. was what I gleaned from it. So I kind of thought this is a strange setup, you know, they would be better just doing it as a kind of Samaritans type thing yeah. rather than tarot cards. But yeah. I guess that's, people's own denial, you know, they go they go to the tarot card phone number because they don't want to admit fully perhaps yeah. that they do have this issue. They, they think they can solve it, you know, or God will solve it or whatever, this exterior force, fate, what you yeah. will. So it was kind of interesting, I guess, you know, how you, you learned a bit about human behaviour from that mm. particular job. Crikey, yeah. Wow. Uh, Murder Crows, as you said, took a number of years to write, but you found a publisher, and that publisher was Unbound. I'm an Unbound author. Uh, you know, you have that whole crowdfunding thing. How did you find that process? Um, very difficult, uh, mm. stressful. Yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, um, it was exciting at first because, you know, I, was, uh, I, I got the publishing deal quite quickly. Uh, I think it was within 24 hours of having sent it, and I got confirmation. And then, of course, you, the crowdfunding starts. And back then, this was five years ago now, I didn't, um, in fact, almost six years ago, I think, and I didn't really have much of a social media following. I still, mine's is still very modest, but it was much, much smaller back then, you know, and I didn't really know much about marketing as such, certainly on social media. So, um, and I had three months, we had a three-month deadline. I think they've changed how they do the, the deadline since then. But the good thing about the deadline was that it meant you really had to try and do it within that set period, which was very stressful, but it forced you mm. to really focus and try and harness everything you could. Um, so it was a lot of work, you know, I had to, you know, once I'd exhausted the initial friends and family, <laughs> I thought, what do I do now? You know, I'm yeah. stuck. I'm stuck at this 30, 40%, you know, of getting, getting the book funded. So I thought, well, you know, we can maybe do something in a shop, in a library, do some readings, invite people along. Um, and that helped. Uh, and then um, a couple of well, fairly well-known people had got in touch as well, one of whom I happened to know, one, some, a friend knew, and that helped as well. And then it, it gradually just built up and, um, yeah, got funded, uh, I think, just under three months, um, which was great. So it was really exciting. 
your book has an amazing cover, really amazing cover. And um, I think, like like me, you, Unbound, they send you a questionnaire, don't they, of things you can put on the cover. She had some involvement in that, didn't you? Yes, that was that. I really loved that. It was one of my favourite aspects of the book. Um, I've forgotten. Oh, that's terrible. I'm trying to remember the artist's name. Mark E. Cobb. That's right, Mark yeah. E. Cobb. He did oh, mine I too. Want, <laughs> yeah, I just want to um, recommend him on here as well because he, yeah. he is amazing. And the, the questionnaire was so detailed as well. And I loved working with him on, on that book cover. Hmm. Um, and he was very patient with me. I was so such a stickler for the, the, the eye of the crow in particular never seemed right and I kept saying there's something not right about it and he went back and forth and then finally he just came up with this thing and I thought that's perfect so I really I really I, I do love that cover mm. and he's amazing he's really really good yeah now the thing with Unbound is um you do sort of get you know certainly if you're on the I think we're both on the digital list you know you get a paperback and you get an ebook version and it kind of gets thrown out there where you have to be your own self promoter do your own marketing post publication how did you find that side of things um well the paperback was actually a surprise because when we signed up to it um you know myself I think it was Jenny Enser Shona Kinsella and Natalie Fergie, you know, it was, it was, we, we kind of formed a bit of a, a group at that time. And uh, none of us knew that there was going to be a paperback. It was only an right. ebook at the time. So we then heard rumours and we thought, and then I think Unbound were celebrating their fifth anniversary. Um, so we all went down to London and basically grabbed Xander, who was with him at the time, <laughs> and pushed him in a corner and said, is it happening? Is this true? <laughs> and he said, yes, um, but don't tell anybody just yet. And, you know, we were absolutely thrilled. So that that was a huge mm. deal because that was basically the very top of my bucket list to have a paperback, Yeah, yeah. Um, which I didn't think was going to happen at the time. So the paperback came about, and then, of course, I had to, as you've, you've, you've pointed out a moment ago, I had to market um, the book. Um, that was, um, I think, because I'd spent so long on it, 28 years, I was really invested in it. Mm-hmm. And because I'd had to crowdfund it as well. So that already gave me a kind of step into marketing, I guess, that, you know, albeit at, yeah. at the deep end. So I, I, and so I was really determined that I, I try and make this the biggest it can be within my limited means um so i was on facebook every single hour practically <laughs> updating no doubt boring everybody with it twitter i think instagram came later and then after that even linkedin and i, I was just constantly um and i made business cards i did posters um i did a launch in waterstones then another one in waterstones in london um, I, w- I would do anything to just try and get the book out there um, in any way, shape, or form that I could. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then you were you were long listed for the not the Booker Prize, which is uh, run by the Guardian. It's kind of all the all the great overlooked books of the year. Do, do you know how that came about? I think it might have been Scott Park who oh. put me forward for it, I think. I don't really know much about it even to this day. Right. Um, so, yeah, I think it might have been. Oh, well, we love Scott. We love Scott. And also, yeah. you you read your own audio book and it won an award. Tell us about that. Uh, yeah, that was... Um, yeah, that came... I think it was six months after the book was published, so it was a, a surprise. I wasn't, we did, it wasn't part of the deal or anything. It just came about and... Um, I kind of knew instinctively, it had a few reviews, you know, and bear in mind it was my debut novel. Um, so I felt, I learned quite quickly that oh, oh, it, it had really positive reviews, but there were some negatives, as you would anticipate with any book, I guess. Um, but I learned from those negatives and I realised that perhaps I hadn't quite got my point across regarding the main character. And I was, I felt very strongly that I wanted to, to do the audiobook myself because I thought, well, nobody knows this book like I do because right. it's lived with me for so long. And I was an actor, so I think I can do it. I'd done some radio work and stuff in the past. And it gave me an opportunity to just give an inflection to the book that perhaps the ebook and the paperback didn't have. So I, I felt I could strengthen, you know, make up for that shortfall by giving it the intonation that I think would help get the meaning across. I think 
to be honest, in some places was missing from the book because it was my debut and I was, you know, I was learning. So all those things, you know, came together. Uh, but I still had to audition. Uh, right. So I yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> had to audition for my own book, uh, which was fine. <laughs> you know, I got accepted, <laughs> strangely <laughs> enough. Um, and then I went down to WF House and mm. um, I, think it, I think it took about two and a half, three days to put together. It was very hard work, very intensive. Yeah, is, and yeah. the one thing I hadn't anticipated was just how many characters I'd written. <laughs> so I think there was about 30, maybe 40, and I had to do different voices for every single mm. one of them. And that was pretty full on. So I was exhausted by the end of it, but yeah. I was really pleased. And it also became a, a bestseller as well. And um, yes, yeah, so that's that was good. I was glad I did it. <laughs> it, is, it is exhausting. I work for a publisher and I've sat in on audio recordings and yeah. I, I don't know how they do it sort of again and again and again. It's it's a it's a brilliant, brilliant skill if you can do it. And having to audition for your own audio book is it's like <laughs> once an actor, always an actor, because I did some acting too. And I remember going along to a, an audition for a, it was for a shampoo commercial. And they were like, Two, three hundred younger, better looking people than me. I thought <laughs> they really want this more than I do. I, but <laughs> I'm, I'm just going to write stuff from that one, you know. So, yeah, it's uh, anyway. Um, Ian, what's coming next from you? And please tell me it's not going to take 28 years. <laughs> no, uh, I, I hope not. I hope not. I, I do have a, I mean, I've, I've got lots of novels that I have planned and, and I've, you know, short stories that I've published since I'm ordered of Crows, which are. I've done as paperbacks, which are available via my website. But in terms of an actual major piece of work, you know, I, I do have a second novel planned um, and I do have a potential sequel planned as well for A Murder of Crows. But this other book, I think, might take precedence because I think it's, um, for me as an author, I think it's more challenging and uh, more interesting at the moment. Um, and then maybe further down the line I might do the, the, the sequel that everybody's still asking me to do. Um, <laughs> so, um, but the, the, the thing is, though, the, the editing has taken over uh, somewhat um, over the past few years, so I've been really, really busy. Um, so, so I'm hoping, though, I've set aside, um, as of June this year, I'm, I've, I'm trying to kind of sort my schedule out, and it's beginning to happen now, you know, that I've got a slightly more... Um, shall we say, humane schedule, you know, um, in terms of the work I'm taking on. So I'm hoping as of June to start work properly on the second novel. Cool. You mentioned you mentioned editing there. You offer editing and, and proofreading services. Uh, tell us about the shift to, to do that as well. Um, well, that came about, um, I'd lost my job actually um, in catering. I'd worked for a catering company for 11 years and without any warning, the company was, you know, dissolved. Um, and I wasn't really too happy with how we were, you know, treated at the time. And um, so I put out this post on Facebook, you know, um, which, you know, a few swear words. I was not very happy. I very rarely ever do that on social media, I have to say. But on this particular occasion, I was quite upset, you know, because I'd, I'd worked really, really hard, you know, for that company. And it was a good job, you know, I did enjoy it. Um, but within three days, I then got a, a proofreading job. And, um, you know, that was jumping in at the deep end again, you know, but I, I seemed to have an eye for it. You know, the author was very happy with the work I did and, and it just built from there and I did training. So I've got some certificates under my belt. I joined the Chartered Institute for Editing and Proofreading, joined the Glasgow Editors Network as well um, and met up with them. This is all obviously before lockdown kicked in. So I did, you know, we were meeting up once a month and um, yeah, and it's just built from there and, and um, you know, I work for I've got a number of clients now and, um, you know, I, I then gravitated into editing as well as proofreading. And, uh, yeah, I really enjoy it. And it's, um, I think it's the, it's, per, it's a job that I'm perfectly suited for. It, it's the first job I've had, perhaps, where I'm not outside my comfort zone. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, I'm at home, you know, and it feels right for someone like me, certainly, to, to be doing this kind of job, you know, as opposed to, selling perfume and, um, <laughs> you know, working, catering, high stress situations and things yeah. like that. I finally feel I've 
kind of landed on my feet, you know, albeit rather late in the day, but at least uh, I've got there. You know, so so I absolutely love this job. Fantastic. Well, folks, we're going to put links in the show notes to Ian's website so you can check out his novellas. And also, if you're looking for a proofreader or editor, check that out too. Ian, thank you so much for speaking to us today. It's an extraordinary story. And um, let's not leave it another 28 years. Let's speak to you again sometime (laughs) soon in the near future. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's been lovely to speak to you. Thank you. What are your writing dreams? Finishing that book, quitting the day job, becoming a best-selling author? Well, over four years, we've studied the advice of over 300 best-selling authors who've collectively sold over half a billion books. And we are excited to announce the Best Seller Academy. If you're ready to take your writing to the next level with accountability, craft, and coaching, your bestseller dreams are now only a click away. To find out more and apply, visit bestsellerexperiment.com forward slash academy. That's bestsellerexperiment.com forward slash academy. Oh my goodness me. So much to unpack in that one, isn't there, Mark? Yeah. I will say though, something that really jumped out for me, um, just, just as a kind of a link to something with the show is um, getting nominated for that Guardian Prize. And I love the fact the Guardian have this kind of kind of almost like anti traditional book book yeah, prize. Because yeah, yeah. I remember, yeah. do you remember when we got in the Guardian very early on? Actually, wasn't it the podcast? Yeah. We got so many new listeners, um, and it has such a great reach. It's now worldwide. I mean, as a you know, obviously mm-hmm. UK newspaper, but the websites now it's all over the world. And um, so, if you are listening to this podcast, having read that. Art Guardian article like back in 2018. Hello, because <laughs> I'm sure oh, there's some people. Thank you. <laughs> a lot of people came along, but I love that. I love this kind of like um, it feels like the kind of alternative Queen speech, doesn't it? On Channel yeah, Four. Yeah, the- yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, the thing is, these awards. I mean, the Booker. How do I say this without it getting litigious? Um, there are certain publishers who are better at applying for prizes than others. Right. I mean, it's uh, it's interesting. I mean, I worked at Orion for sixteen years. We never got a whiff of the Booker, despite having some Booker worthy novels. You know, I think I think that's um, yeah. It's there. There are ways of applying. You've really got to want it. It's like the Oscars. I mean, the Oscars is all about the campaign. You know. Yeah. So there are so, uh, there are some. I, I'm one of those people who, who will say, "Ah, oh, awards don't mean anything." Until I'm nominated for one, <laughs> exactly um, right, yeah. and win one <laughs> exactly <laughs> right, um, all over the front cover of the book, <laughs> big but, gold know, laminate so, circle. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, I, I I don't go chasing after them, and I, I think I think the nice thing with with Ian, he doesn't strike me as someone who goes chasing. But I think the publisher said we've got something special here, so let's put Ian forward for this, yeah. and that's um, and I couldn't, I, you know, I I can't think of a better. Uh, kind of award for his book as well. So, mm. you know, it's, it's, um, it's, it's, it is alternative and off the beaten path, you know? Yeah, I think it's, I think it's great. And it's a huge confidence boost as well. I mean, we always celebrate, we've had loads of people win awards, you know, bestseller Academy members and bestseller experiments. They've lots of people who've entered and lots of people who get long listed and short listed. And, and even those, I mean, just, just to even get on a long list or a short list, it's incredibly exciting mm. um, and helps people kind of, get to that stage where they really start believing in their abilities because we're always often the last person to really believe that what we're doing is any good <laughs> yeah. it's like someone yeah. has to kind of hit you overhead with a bat and say look you can write keep going you know yeah. so it's this idea of external validation is 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 although like you say it's it, you know we should just be able to kind of bring that from within so to speak but external validation can be a huge huge shot in the arm and um I think yeah, no COVID uh, pun intended there. But in terms of in terms of actually going <laughs> going for it, I really recommend people you know put themselves out there and try some try some awards because you just never know as well. That's the beauty of these things. And and I love things like the Guardian. This Guardian Award sounds a, feels a bit like the Mercury Music Prize to me. It's like it's actually yeah, a, yeah, yeah. an award. It's the that, cool one. It's the cool yeah. one, and it's the one that champions. <laughs> The underdog in many ways champions yeah, yeah, yeah. the indie, yeah. I think, in many yeah. ways. So, yeah, I think it's great. And, and the more the merrier, I think, when it comes to that kind of thing. Mm, absolutely. 
it was also really interesting to to hear about i mean let's talk about the the whole incident that he experienced as a child i mean i i was thinking back as i was listening to that, that there are so many moments in our childhood where you experience something and you never forget it um but to experience something on that level i mean it's it it changes the way you see life it changes you know i can't imagine some of the conversations that must have happened in the household like after that event it's quite fun. Yeah. You could see, you could hear in Ian's voice how it's still to this day, you know, yeah. is a, was a profound moment in his life. Absolutely. The weird thing is, as soon as I finished interviewing Ian, I got in touch with my mum because I, I have this memory of walking home with mum from school and I was very young and seeing a woman on a building site. We were walking past a building site and this woman and had – a terrible accident. I think she tried to take a shortcut across the building site. And I remember, and this is a bit icky, folks, but I remember she had glass, shards of glass in her face. It's like she'd walked mm. through a plate glass window. And that memory has stayed with me ever since. And I got in touch with mum and I said, yeah, the, do you remember this? And she doesn't remember it. Really? And there's a part of me thinking, did I make that up? Is that a false memory? And, and, and it's been on my mind because I've been reading, because I'm, I'm interviewing Joanne Harris um, tomorrow in Tunbridge Wells for a new book, A Narrow Door. And it's a big theme in this as well, this idea of repressed memories, memories that we bury, mer- memories that memories that suddenly appear out of nowhere after years of being hidden away, uh, the elasticity of memory. Mm. And it's just so – and I've got – you know. So- <laughs> So immediately I'm beginning to question my own mind. Is this just the product of my own warped, <laughs> you know, the, I write horror movies, folks, you know, yeah, <laughs> is yeah, it yeah. just my own strange warped mind or did it happen and maybe my mum's blocked it out uh, mm. or, you know, so it's some, um, it's really strange, really, really as, strange. I think as, um, as I, I know from my experience, I, I, I always get confused between what's a memory and what was on my dad's cine camera. <laughs> right. Do you remember the cine cameras, which you used to have? My Well, we never had one. Oh, my we gosh. We never had one. Anyone, anyone think this is a nostalgic moment, but I used to remember that. that so it's a real, it's pre kind yeah, of yeah. video, video oh, yeah. cameras. Eight. Super 8, Super 8. Yeah. So you put on this big, big reel and and you sit there and, and you try and feed it in and then it starts flicking and you, you project it on a, a wall. In, we used to project it on a wall in our living room. And you'd always be sitting there waiting for that awful moment where you suddenly get that weird brown kind of, and it's just like that <laughs> the burn, burn, burn out, the yeah. burning of the, of the, but my dad had, I think they only held a few minutes of video and we've got some yes. video from when we were at Chessington Zoo. Mm. And, and I remember watching it and now I have this memory of me being on my uncle's shoulders and I must've only been about two, but I'm thinking, I don't remember anything else that happened when I was two. And it's like thing has blurred between whether it's a memory or whether it's the thing that I saw on video. And I also think as kids, we tend we tend to see things. Everything's magnified when we're smaller. Yeah. Like everything's so much yeah. bigger. We're like in you know, it's like being in Gulliver's world. Um, and it is, but it, but the, but the impact, the impact of what happens remains because that remains not trapped as a childhood memory, but the experience of it remains in you as you experienced yeah. it as a child. That's the it, really interesting bit. It makes me wonder how the digital generation, how it will affect them. Because my kids, you know, I didn't, I, we didn't have a Super 8 camera. We only had a crappy still camera as well. We've got very, very few photographs of my childhood compared to what my my kids uh, it's like there's a bloody it's uh, like a documentary, documentary crew documentary. following yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. everything we've got video we've got hours of video i've backed them all up onto dvd i've backed them all up onto the cloud you know we've got hours and hours and hours so my kids childhood is very very well documented and they will and I, you know there's a part you're wondering if it's a good thing or a bad thing because mm. their memories are steered by what they've seen on because they'll sit down and go oh let's watch when George is eating spaghetti and falling asleep, you know, because it's a great video. We've got everybody who's like 18 months old and he's stuffing his face with spaghetti and nodding off at the same time. Um, so, you know, we'll watch that again. And of course, that's a key memory for him. But of course, he's seeing it as as like an out-of-body experience. Literally, yes. So, whereas, yeah. whereas all my childhood memories are out of these peepers, you know, mm-hmm. so I've got memories now and I'm, 
you know, I've got a memory of going to Ireland uh, with my family to see my family at Halloween. That's a very early memory and of, of scary ghosts at the door. These are all these have all messed me up terribly. Uh, I got, you know, and that same trip, my my uncle Luce telling me ghost stories. Um, but again, there's a part of me thinking, am I just am I remembering them as they actually were? I'm probably not. Um, am I? Did they even happen in the first place? Is it an amalgam of memories? As my, as my, um, we were, we were talking before we start recording about the way that you know AI is helping us, you know, mix music and videos and things like that to the you know to the point where it's becoming automated. Is my brain doing that? Is my brain doing a TikTok <laughs> <laughs> mashup of of my childhood? Mm. So um, yeah, memory is such a such a strange thing, and. Um, but yeah, for, the thing with Ian is his mother was there to witness it too, and obviously that's not something she would forget in a hurry either. So and it's yeah. it's something they talked about afterwards. So yeah, that's yeah. that's that's one of those stakes in the ground of your life, isn't it? That that it is. Movable. Yeah, it's like a prof- a profound moment which forever changes the way you see the world. And I think it, it's really it's a bit of a sliding doors moment, isn't it? Where you think, I wonder what would have happened. I wonder what Ian stories would be like if he hadn't had that experience you know and Mm. so in many ways being especially being exposed to death at a very young age uh, especially something as as awful as you know finding somebody like hanging um you know that that you you never forget that i think um but it also the interesting about children is they don't often develop the capacity at an early age to really truly understand death. That's mm-hmm. why actually we become really fascinated in horror when we when we reach kind of preteen and then we start wanting mm-hmm. to read our first Stephen King novel when we're around that age and we start to want to explore that and face it because that's part of our development. Mm-hmm. We talked about this on the podcast before, haven't we, with horror? Yeah. I mean, it is part yeah. of a that kind of a passage. And, and, yeah, when we yeah. all go through it, um, we face our fears. Is really what we're doing. Yeah, and um, but to, to 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 be exposed to something so early on, it it almost forces it fast forwards a child into a kind of what is a kind of a, an early adult space, and therefore it can have really interesting effects on how they see the world, um, and and can be quite scary. It can be very scary as well because you're not really thinking about death when you're running around on the playground playing with your mates at yeah. you know, seven or eight years of age. Um, mm. But yeah, but interesting. And I, I and I do find it fascinating. It's it's wonderful that Ian can share that story with us because it, it makes me realize just how much of an effect it's had on his, his mm. career. Um, and, mm. you know, in some ways, um, it, shone a different light on maybe how he's how he writes today which is fascinating mm. um it's interesting as well that he then kind of went into this job doing tarot cards as well and, and <laughs> predicting futures and taking these phone calls but um again fascinating how we've talked about mental health before a lot on this show but fascinating how we're saying a lot of people are just calling up with challenges and problems and really the tarot cards were there as a kind of a, a bridge uh, to talk to someone about what was going on Yes, and I think there's a storytelling element there too. You're Ian clearly very aware of what people might have wanted to hear rather than maybe what they needed to hear. Um and you know, not being very wary that aware that delivering the wrong thing would have a profound effect on mm. uh on on their lives. Whereas in fiction it's much more of a safe space, you know, which is why horror is so popular because people can confront these things in a safe space. There's you you know you you get goosebumps, you might get a few nightmares, but ultimately it's not it's not going to do any long-term harm, you know. Yeah, and there's and the it, laughter that you get in horror as well where yes. there's that release, there's that release of energy and yeah. you can do that in a safe environment as well. And it's it's interesting as yeah, well with yeah. Ian that there seems to be this theme of storytelling all through his his life yeah. and he talked about going yeah. into theater and drama and i was fascinated to hear about how he talked about uh how how, th- how being on stage really helped him learn a lot about dialogue and i'm sure that you've you probably got so much benefit from that when you would when you were working in theater as well completely completely and i i you know i again i say this to people in, in the academy it's if you can 
get in with a bunch of local actors or sign up with a drama course or whatever just for a short period it's it's always worth doing because you learn so much by just getting a scene up on its feet and working with dialogue uh, or improvising as well you soon learn what's important and what's not important what sounds right um you know and i i i used to I mean, dialogue is is kind of my strength. It comes quite easily to me, but that's because I've always my family has always told stories rather than write them down. So we're good. They're all, I come from a family of good, rac, you know, raconteurs who would, who would tell a story around the dinner table, you know. Uh, and then when I was at school, we used to write sketches and stuff. We thought we were going to be the new Monty Python. We clearly weren't. But you know, so we we it, a lot of that was wordplay and uh, and and stuff like that. So. And um, a lot of improv as well. So it's always something that I've enjoyed doing. And it's um, even now I will, you know, because I, I write in a notebook before I type stuff up, I'll write whole scenes, just dialogue, just getting the actors, the actors, the characters up on their feet, a bit of chit chat. I overwrite, I write far too much, but in there are little nuggets that I know I can take on to the actual scene that I, I want to write. So, um, yeah, it's uh, it's it's um, it's always worth doing if you, if you ever get that opportunity. But the the thing that really really interested me was was that he, uh, Murder of Crows, was a graphic novel, then a play, and then a novel. So he took it through these different media before it found its final uh, form uh, as a novel, and that. I've sort of done that. I've I've certainly done plays that have been screenplays that have, I mean, The Witches of Woodville has gone through everything. That was, you know, a TV script, then it was a film script, then it started as a, a novel which wasn't working, and then I changed it back to a TV script. It's sort of ping pong between all of them. So um so yeah, I I have had some experience of that where you just try something. Is this a novel? Is this a comic book? Is this a, a radio play? Is this a film? What what is this? And um you know, depending on the nature of the story, the nature of the characters, how big or how short or what, you know, it is, then it, you know, you have to tinker with things before you find its form. Mm. It's funny you mentioned sketches and Monty Python. My youngest <laughs> did her first uh, theatre debut on the weekend mm. and it was brilliant. It was a Monty Python-esque evening of crazy bonkers sketches. They did the cheese shop. Uh, but the... <laughs> But um, what was amazing was my daughter, who's 13, is on stage with people in their 80s. It was such an incredible experience where um, new and young and old all came together. And yeah. um, it was absolutely brilliant. And I thought, wow, this is, such a, this is such a great thing for her to get involved in at such a young age. And her mum was a theatre director. So, you know, she's kind of Fantastic. following in the footsteps of Jen, well, which what, is just brilliant. When I was 15, I did my first theatre work outside of school. I'd done school plays and stuff, but I, I got in with a, a theatre group called The Sturdy Beggars in Leatherhead. And, um, you know, we did stuff at the the Castle Room, the little studio theatre at the Thorndike Theatre. You know? oh, so yeah. I'm, at 15, I felt like a proper actor, you know, and yeah. it was... Uh, and that's and then where there it was a, starts, isn't it? Yeah, and there was a group in Ashton called the Ashton Players, which is where Claire and I got together. Um, and again, you're, you're working with all ages there as well. And it's great because you have really experienced people, people who are just starting out just like you. And it's that... that team thing that group thing is is so important and so invigorating and you know what ian was talking about being an actor and having to jump through hoops for other people i i did get sick of that after a while i talk about doing that shampoo commercial and thinking i'll solve well, this for a game this was song. the question on every, i was actually <laughs> going to get to that mark because the question on everyone's lips uh is what brand of shampoo was it uh i honestly can't remember if it wasn't timote not- was it did you have to flick <laughs> your hair back you know what? I I got a horrible feeling that being a pomp the pompous little prat that I was in my early twenties, I think I just walked out. I thought I went in there. Oh, <laughs> sod this! I'm not bollocks this. So, I, oh. I would, you know, so I I, I was I hoping you were going to say did. that you actually got the job and there's some hidden yeah. footage somewhere on one of those yeah. DVDs you mentioned earlier. Yeah, yeah, that, that's probably mm. why I walked out. So oh, no, yeah. I, I that, that was priceless. that was the thing that inspired me. Funnily enough, that was the thing that inspired me. I thought I'm going to have to write my own plays. Oh. So we did. We did a. Uh, we did a couple of David. Mam- we did a David Mamet play. Two of them actually. Um, 
and then we did Frank and John in the Claire de Lune, and then I I started writing my own stuff, writing your own ones. But so it just that shows audition, you, doesn't it? You know, yeah. yeah, yeah. It just shows you, like, even out of something which you th- you go to and think, hmm, you know, this isn't for me. It's it was the catalyst for yeah. you moving in, and and I think about that in authors' lives as well. I you know think about you know when people are writing books, there are always moments during that journey which become catalysts in either their own experience of writing the book or um, something random that happens in their life yeah. which they can then put onto a character. I think, oh, that's there's a solution right there for them where I'm stuck. But mm. absolutely brilliant. I was really interested to hear as well that uh, Ian worked really, really hard. You know, it sounded like he was out there gra- grafting, talking to bookshops on socials every day. Mm. Uh, it does take a certain kind of person, doesn't it, to to embrace that um, marathon, I want to call it, because that's what it feels like when you're out there pushing, you know, a book crowdfunding. We've talked about this before, but it sounds like Ian had all the kind of right, the right kind of um, attitude towards that. Yeah, and it, the, thing, the thing is... It is. It is hard. It really is hard. I've no inclination to go back to crowdfunding again. It's. Um, I'm glad I did it. I'm glad I did it once. I'm glad I don't have to do it again. You know. I mean, we we've talked on about kickstarters and stuff like that, which I would consider further down the line. You know, uh, maybe for other projects, but that that's yeah. for me. Yeah. Whereas Unbound, it's it's kind of a slightly different thing. You know, uh, it's um, it is really really hard, and you've you've really got to want it. You know, you've really got to. Um, uh, uh, by the way, folks, I've got a. Uh, we did a deep dive on this um, on crowdfunding. I've got a blog that I'll share that where I, I sort of talk about the the things that I did. I go into it in quite sort of nerdy detail about the spreadsheets that I kept mm-hmm. and stuff like that, and how I chase people up. So I'll dig those out and put links in the show notes so you can have a look at those. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's exhausting, frankly. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm glad I, I'm glad I did it, and the book is great. as as exhausting as trying to remember 40 different characters voices <laughs> i can't <Yeah>. believe that <laughs> you know how you know how into you be practicing you know before you go on stage or something and you're, you're standing in front of the mirror and you're practicing that one accent mm. it must be so hard to be switching between different voices that you're and you're doing every single one of them i don't know how you pull that off no I, it's, but some sometimes it's not just an accent sometimes it's just a tone uh, or a pace, or just a sort of slight incline to the way that you speak. That that you know, because you don't you don't want to be the man of a thousand voices. Because I think it gets distracting. But you have to you have to keep a certain kind of consistency there. Um, so yeah, funny enough, uh, I'm going to the recording of the audiobook of Ghost of Ivy Barn soon. So Ooh, uh, I'll let you know how that pans out. Because I've given poor Candida, who's narrating this quite a few accents to compete with so <laughs> i might ask her how she does it actually <laughs> brilliant that'd be fascinating excellent stuff brilliant well thank you so much ian for coming on the show and if you're interested in finding out more about ian um please check out the show notes on the website bestsellerexperiment.com so mr stay socials i get that i'm guessing there might be a couple of bookshops in there this week we do have some good bookshops yeah uh we do have some good social media stuff a lot of it is about um, the 200 word challenge and we've got some extremes here you know so mark hood checked in mark hood uh let's have a look his writing streak he hit 900 days <laughs> and <laughs> 576 thousand words which is just phenomenal wow. uh i mean mark hood we salute you but mark Hood also checked in he said okay he said okay mark d is always banging on about celebrating the wins you're banging on mr d banging on i do bang uh, on. So, uh, Mark Hood says, I'm muzzling the inner voice that says not to blow your own trumpet for a minute. I got a lovely email from someone saying he heard about my War of the World sequel from a Facebook group, loved reading it. Uh, I dropped into the group to find a whole thread about it, which absolutely made my day. And some of the quotes, which is probably the best sequel to War of the Worlds I've read so far. Can't wait for the next one. A bloody great read, very much in tone with the original. Uh, Of the very many sequels and spin-offs, this is one of the very best. So he says, right. 
one small slice of Colin the caterpillar to celebrate them back to self-deprecation. Oh, fa- fantastic. Congratulations <laughs> on that, Mark. And folks, if you're a fan of um, War of the Worlds, I'll put a link to Mark's book in uh, in the show notes. You can check that out. It's a short story that sort of bridges the two novels as well, which I really enjoyed. It's really, really good. And it, it really does capture that H.G. Wells tone. And absolutely right, those reviews. So congrats on that, Mr. Hood. Brilliant work, Mark. And at the other end of the 200 word a day challenge, because, you know, we tweet about it and, um, you know, have you banked your words today? That kind of thing. And uh, Nicholas Kessler, who is Nick underscore Kessler, N-I-C underscore Kessler on Twitter. He said, look, <laughs> weekends are a nightmare. I just dot, dot, dot. I'm going to celebrate a six day streak as it's one more than my average five. Well, Nick, we salute you. Brilliant. You know, six Absolutely days. Absolutely great. Top Love work. It. Fantastic. And we do that. It's funny. It, we, we've started doing this in the academy where we, we're kind of showing, we're, we're celebrating people's writing, how many words they wrote this week, how many words they wrote this month, their streaks. But it's also about celebrating. There's so many people in the academy who say, I just did my first seven day streak. And it's and it's massive. It's huge. And it's as big. It's I mean, that is as big as any other achievement because you've got to do that in order to kind of start to build on it. So congratulations. Absolutely. congratulations. Absolutely. Now, Kate Baker. Um, she put a very long and sad uh, post on the BXP group uh, on Facebook about how she broke her streak. Um, but she also tweeted about it too. And she said, look, I've broken my 200 words a day streak. I got to 149, refused to see it as a failure. Instead, I celebrate a wicked run and starting again today, I am to beat it. I mean, that's the attitude, isn't that's, it? You know, that's, that's, um, that's what it's all about. Absolutely. absolutely. It's all about personal bests. It's funny because I actually start. I'm I'm coaching track uh, kids at the track team locally here, Mark, as well. Right, and uh, you know, there's always the kids that are the superstars and the, you know doing things amazing, amazing things. But I'm always stressing to the to the kids, and these kids are like you know, eight years old up to like you know mid teens. And I always say to them, I said, look, getting first is great, absolutely brilliant. Yeah, you want to you want to be an Olympic hundred meter winner. You know, go for it, live that dream. But it's actually all about day to day your personal best. It's can you beat, can you can you beat what you did last weekend, three weekends ago, last year? Um, can you be better than you were yesterday? And that's what the writing challenge is about. It's like, what's your personal best? If you've written three days in a row, great. And you fall off the wagon, you're human. Go for four on your next streak. Yeah. Absolutely brilliant. Yeah. So well done, Kate. And we salute yeah. you. And it, you, before you know it, before you know it, you'll be at 100 and, 150 and you'll be rocking and rolling. Yeah, absolutely. And a couple of um, bit, bits of book news as well. Craig Anderson, I've always got a soft spot for Craig because Craig was the first listener to send us one of his books. That was the Lucky Beggar trilogy. Do you remember that? That I was the first book we got on the post. Like, I have that um, book on my shelf, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so do I. Uh, so Craig is still going strong. He's just published a book called Max Luck, which looks absolutely terrific. I'm going to put a link in the show notes to that as well. And I've just remembered as well. Wait there, listeners. I'm just going to come back. Ooh, uh, drum roll. Is, uh, Mark's wandering off into his library. Angela, Angela Nurse, who did um, Jack in a Box and Sally in the Woods, she um, she basically did, she was supposed to send me these books a while ago, but forgot and found them in a box uh, and sent them to me. So they arrived, but also with this little fella who she hand knitted. This Aww. is a little blue <laughs> teddy bear, and um, I'm open to suggestions for names, folks. Okay. So um, if you've got a name for little Bluey here, I mean Bluey could work, but um, so yeah, any any suggestions for names? Um, uh, BXP the bear, I don't know. Maybe Maybe. I don't know. Let's see. But yes, thank you very much for that, Angela. And uh, yes, check out um, uh, Jack in a Box and Sally in the Woods uh, from Angela C. Nurse. Do check that out. So thank you very much. Oh, you're um, getting all kinds of incredible things. You get. <laughs> I'm, I'm shameless. Absolutely shameless. Um, <clears throat> so listener bookshops, uh, we, we're all about celebrating uh, book your favorite bookshops out there and uh we've we've been deluged with them so we you know if you haven't heard your bookshop called out uh do, don't stop sending it in keep sending them in we love hearing from you uh tommy dunn got in touch and uh said uh right blend in crosby uh, he said bob who owns right blend provides immeasurable support for traditional and independent authors he hosts book launches and readings there's a coffee shop allowing people to spend time browsing and just chatting over their purposes there's purchases there's a pop-up record store upstairs with a wide selection of vinyl and cds this sounds like the best shop ever <laughs> more importantly bob provides friendly support and advice to customers and authors at the shop being an independent author himself uh, uh, this is bob 
Stone, the owner. He understands the challenges faced when writing, editing, and getting your book out there. And Bob joined in the conversation. Uh, Bob said, "Bob said, thank you, Tommy, for this wonderful testimonial. I'm humbled and honoured. Just a tiny correction. He had to close the coffee shop at Christmas. Thanks, COVID. So the record shop upstairs is now a permanent fixture. Well, look, there's too many bloody coffee shops in the world anyway. Not enough record stores. So coffee's loss is vinyl's gain. <laughs> um, so, yeah, that's Right Blend in Crosby. And we'll put links in the show notes to these so you can check these out. Um, and then we've got uh, a couple in uh, Bath. So Jack Harmon got in touch. He said, my favourite is Toppings in Bath. They have a great event programme and are my go-to for good browse and sign books. I'm not sure if they still do, but they used to make visitors a cup of tea or coffee, which sounds wonderful. Sure. Um, and also Joe jo Nadin, who is a best-selling author, award-winning author, and she was on episode 150 of the uh, of the podcast. I'll put a link to that in the show notes. Lots of links in this week's. Uh, Joe jo recommended Mr. B's in Bath and Bookish in Crickhowl. And she said they're the best booksellers, welcoming, wildly enthusiastic, plus Bookish has cake and Mr. B's has a toilet decorated by Chris Riddell. And Chris Riddell is the illustrator and author of Goth Girl. He's done illustrations for yeah. Neil Gaiman and all kinds of amazing authors. So, yeah, check those out. Links in the show notes. Thank you very much for those folks and keep them coming. Keep them coming. And and in particular, inspired, inspired by Bob. We need more Bobs out there. Yeah. I, we want to hear about bookshops that are supporting you as an indie author. And yeah. uh, I think I think that should be an additional. We'll give you a shout out. So if, because I actually had a really interesting experience, Mark, two, two local bookstores. Um, I went into both of them with Jen's book when I was when we were mm-hmm. launching it, and we had we had over I don't know, over a thousand pre orders directly on the website. One one bookstore, uh, Fireside Books. Give him a shout out. Fireside Books, brilliant. Love Fireside Books. Um, he said, absolutely brilliant. Want to support this? And he and he bought ten copies off me there and then. I mean, wow. like, which is unbelievable because usually you yeah. you leave your book and if you're lucky, you know, you go back later and yeah, then you might yeah. get some money. He bought them off me there and then. Went to the other local book shopping shop in town. This, this was a few years ago and they've now been taken over. So I'm not going to mention names, but they basically said, Oh, well, you know, if you want to do this, uh, you have to fill out this form and then you have to pay this money. And, that, and I'm like, what? This is like a local. So you do get two very different approaches. So if yeah. there are bookshops out there that are embracing you as a local author and, and putting your book at the, you know, in the front window or by the till, as we saw the other day, I love that yes. photo on, on the, uh, BXP team group there. Um, we really want to celebrate these bookshops because they are the bread and butter for keeping you alive. And I do really think, I think it's so important that you get that local kind of nucleus build up because that's where the worst word of mouth spreads. We talked about this on the Academy on Monday, actually, about yeah. building this nucleus and then and then building out locally, you know, county, province, uh, state, and then the world, you know, in the country and the world. Yeah. But start start local and 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 Anyone that's celebrating you as an author, we, we want to give them a plug. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, get, drop us a line. Come and find us. We're on bestsellerexperiment.com. There's a contact tab there where you can email us or drop us a line on social media. Uh, Facebook is Bestseller Experiment. Twitter and Instagram is at Bestseller XP. And if you've enjoyed this episode, if you've been inspired by Ian or any of the authors we've had on the show, do please give us a rating tell all your friends about us, do subscribe. I've been really encouraged because the last, I think every month this year, our listening figures have gone up, up, up. So people are clearly spreading the word and we really thank you for that. And it's, you know, getting out to to writers in every far-flung corner of the planet, getting their words out there, getting their voices heard. Brilliant stuff. And if you'd like to get our weekly newsletter about our new episodes each week, telling you what you can learn from them and links to everything, pop along to bestsellerexperiment.com, click on the newsletter tab and pop your email address in. And if you would like to join our incredible band of merry patrons and support this podcast, just pop along to bestsellerexperiment.com forward slash support. It costs less. They will say that every podcast is it's less than a latte, but it is literally. You can you can support this podcast with a minimum uh, two dollar a month donation, all the way up to however much you're you're willing to help us out with. So please do pop along um, and get those goodies because they are absolutely priceless. We can't even put a price on the Cami Mart. Absolutely no, fantastic. And we do. If you're interested in joining the academy, do you? If you're interested in joining the academy, we are opening the doors at the end of June. If you're interested in starting your journey halfway through this wonderful year of 2022, 
get onto the site and uh, get your applications in now, folks. You've got a few weeks left to do that. <laughs> so, Mr. Stay, I hope you have a fantastic week, sir. Any Anything exciting planned? Yes, I'm, I'm on stage with Joanne Harris tomorrow. I know we mentioned it in the last one, but it's, uh, it's on tomorrow. And if you're thinking, oh, nuts, I've missed out on seeing Joanne Harris. Well, guess who's our special guest on next week's podcast? Dun, dun, Joanne dun. Harris. <laughs> 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 so, uh, yeah. So, uh, and um, look, I've put Bluey, Bluey the BXP bear on my microphone. I feel like I'm on University Challenge, you know, <laughs> my, my lucky gonk. Brilliant. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, that's, that's my week. And I'm visiting bookshops and all sorts of fun stuff. Fantastic. Well, listen, have a great week. And for everyone out there listening, have a great writing week this week as well. Keep inspired. Push yourself through those boundaries. Forget about all that self-doubt. It's all made up in your head. Yeah. You're brilliant authors. Keep writing. Keep going forward. And we look forward to continually to inspire you next week with the incredible Joanne Harris. So don't miss that, folks. So it's oh, a goodbye yeah. from Mark 1. And a goodbye from Mark 2. Teddy bye. Goodbye. Bye. Bye.